Okay, uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> uh, oh God, we thank you for all the love and grace you have showered upon us. And as we approach you, Lord, we want to come with a single mind on your words and on your personality. Father, we want to know you in spirit and in truth. And I pray that the Holy Spirit make clear to us your mind. And let us be willing to incline ourselves to you and to seek you in your words. And I pray that this time, that the spirit of discernment and wisdom will be given us, that we will follow you closely, Lord, in what you are going to teach us through the pulpit. And I pray that all these young lives, that you have prepared their hearts to be here. Lord, although they are young, but Lord, you open up their minds and their hearts to your word and give them the spirit of revelation. Every one of us here, that we will grow in knowledge of you. And that's what we ask for in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a lot about the fundamentals uh, of Christianity. And I've said last week, I am very concerned about um, the way that Christians nowadays, the way they are approaching Christianity uh, without the right sense. Um, I've been in church for 20 over years. I've heard many sermons. So I tend to feel that um, there are shortfalls in teaching. And that's why uh, believers are not getting the right basis of their belief. And just to mention a few, say for instance, on, I've, I've grown up in a traditional church. And you know in traditional church, um, and not all, but most of them, or quite a number, they emphasize a lot on good works, uh, performance, good conduct, an outward portrayal of good behavior of a Christian, you know. So they always associate like dynamic faith, uh, a, a good Christian uh, testimonies, and you know, a living, uh, a good life, good conduct in association with spirituality. So a spiritual person to them definitely have to be good in behavior, uh, have to be able to sacrifice, have to be sh able to show the, the works of faith. I mean, nothing wrong, but it comes to a point that when people are talking a lot about all these works and performance, but they didn't tell the believers what is the basis of being able to do all this? You get what I'm trying to say? Now, what is the basis? Uh, doing all these good works, is good work an end in itself? And does it come from your own effort or is it from the Holy Spirit? And what gives people the inclination, the desire and the strength to live, to live good testimonies to love people and live holy lives. What is it? I don't get these in, in traditional church last time. And I, I realized I struggle a lot with this. Because some people are born with a good nature, obedient nature. They obey their parents. Okay, they obey the church leaders. They obey God. You know, simple. But it has to come from the spirit of man. So, so much so that I felt this outward portrayal teaching become hypocritical, in a sense, in church. Why do I say that? For instance, I, last week I shared about how I was born again uh, uh, when I was 12 years old, remember? You know, I went to church when I was 8 and did my sinner's prayer 11. But it wasn't until 12 or 13 years old where, where a transformation came into me, the, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. During then, I started to realize the Word of God makes sense to me. The hymns make sense to me. So I start singing. So when, when I, I remember when I went to Sunday school, you know, I was just singing so loud and can feel the difference you know, with everyone else beside me. Uh, some, although I felt a bit of embarrassment you know, because no one was like singing as loudly as me, but I was singing. I don't care because it makes sense to me. I just want to praise God and worship God. And then after that, I realized from that Sunday onwards, 
uh, I was picked to pray always frequently <laughs> so so probably uh, I probably m the teachers there were, was looking at me you know this guy was like singing loudly and, and they choose me you know so so but why, why do I say it? But you see, what I mean is they, they look at what I am showing outwardly, but what goes on inside me, they may not notice. Uh, why do I say that? Because why? Um, sometimes when I'm not in the shape of singing hymns, I was not picked to pray. <laughs> and then someone else who, who starts singing and then they were picked to pray. So I have a sense that people are just looking at the very superficial side only. Uh, is it their, their zeal? Uh, is it their courage? Or is it their ability to, to sacrifice something you know, for the church, for people? Or doing some good works in obedience to the pastor? No, I think through. Now, these are outward things. Although I believe a truly born again person will have the evidence of good works, but I want all of us to be mindful that that everything got to come from the inside. All the good works of men. If you tell a believer, now you have to live good lives, it must come from him meeting the Lord inside him, transformed by the Holy Spirit inside him, being regenerated and truly living his life for God, for the kingdom. And these things happening, supernatural things happening inside him, will incline him naturally to good works. And this is what I'm going to talk about, okay? So that's one side. That's one side, I'm talking about one side of superficial Christianity. People are talking so much about the outward conduct and they fail to realize what happened in a person's inner life. So, so we will start to see people who can be zealous about everything, like singing, serving, attending meetings, even cooking, you know, in church, you know. They have accustomed themselves to certain norms. And, and sometimes I've shared last week that these people, um, when I grew up with some of them, they left the church, you know, and, and when, they are, when they've grown up, they left the church without feeling any guilt at all. It gives me a question mark. Is this works, works thing, the works teaching, the, the really uh, fundamental teaching that God is giving us? Then, then, as I grew up, you know, I, was, I was in Christ for 20 over years, and, and I associate myself with some other believers, then I realized there's another set of teachings in Christianity uh, that make the gospel too good, too beautiful, but without any basis. They were always talking about, oh, you are loved, you are blessed, you know, in Christ, you know. Uh, you will never go to hell. But what is the basis? Um, just because you have said a sinner's prayer or you have been baptized? But these people, they have no... Some people, I realize, they have no sense towards God. And they have no sense towards God's word. They don't care. And then people just come to them and say, Hey, you are loved. You won't go to hell. You, know, you are blessed. With all the blessing in heaven and earth. You know? I mean, is, is, isn't this too quick to say? I, I mean, too quick to say this or to certain people? Shouldn't we have a discernment? Who are the people who truly deserve these blessings? Who are the truly loved ones? The chosen ones? And this is not made clear. And how do we know people are saved? Is it just by a sinner prayer or emotional experience? Uh, yesterday I was talking to an American missionary. You know, uh, she, uh, I mean, he, he ministered to people in uh, uh, to, in Asia, and then he went to be a ch went to China to be a missionary, and there, he was very puzzled about some how some Chinese came came to church, and accepted the Lord. But he was always puzzled whether they are true believers. And there was this sister, uh, non-believing sister, came to the church crying. Um, don't know for whatever problems you know she has you know but when the, when she sings a hymn she cry when she heard the message she cry you know so the natural tendency for a pastor is wow this fellow must, must be the Holy Spirit working you know? so someone just just talk to her and bring her to Christ she was crying doing the sinner's prayer and accepting Jesus then after that the pastor said okay I, I congratulate you I bless you so now from next week onwards come to church you know live a church standard life and they, huh? 
come to church. I thought I already believe. <laughs> so that's it. She, she don't sense she needs to come to church. She don't sense the need to follow God. But with all this crying out, she just cry her heart out. You know, it's an emotional experience. You get what I mean? And for such people, and, and then later on, she didn't turn up in church. And then six months later, someone from, from his church, you know, happened to meet this sister again. You know, oh, she was baptized. Baptized. And then talked to her again. But, but he told the pastor from the way he thinks, the way he talks, the way he lives, his, her life has nothing to do with Christianity. These people can be baptized. Or sometimes even they can be zealously serving in the church. I, I went to China. I mean, I was in China as a missionary. I know all these things happening. So I want people to be truly born again. When we say you are loved in Christ, you are chosen, you are saved, all blessings on heaven and earth is yours. You will never go to hell. On what basis? I want to know. Okay. So um, I believe pastors and teachers have a responsibility to, to teach believers how to examine their faith I'm talking about. And Paul says, you have to examine your faith, your salvation of faith, to make sure that you have not failed the test. Is that right? You remember that? Paul said that. Examine yourself. So look at the way you are thinking, the way you are living. Look at your heart and your mind to know whether Christ is in you. Now, that's the thing. So for me, it's my responsibility to help you examine yourselves okay, so, so that your works, your whatever endurance may be based upon genuine faith. Okay? So today I'm going to talk about how to know whether you are loved and chosen in Christ. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, you enter the kingdom of God. You know, not all who say, Lord, I preach in your name, prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, will enter the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. So how do you know? On what basis? It's not the works thing. You are not saved by works. But it's not the easy gospel where you promise everything too good, too real, without any basis. Whether the transformational work have already come upon a person, you don't know. You just want to bless the person just because of certain significant or riches that he has gone through. No, that's not right. That's not in real Christianity. Okay, so we turn to 1 Thessalonians uh, Chapter 1. Over here you will see Paul. Okay. He talks very clearly about who are the born again. And if you are struggling with your identity or whether you are safe or not, uh, or whether or why you are safe but now you are at a juncture of struggling for faith. Now you have to receive answers from these messages. Okay, verse one, chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 1, verse 2, 1 Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you, and Paul said, mentioning you in our prayers. And as he mentioned, he think through their lives. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now over here, I want to draw your attention to what is both on the inside and outside of a genuine believer. What is on the outside can be easily seen by man. What is it? You look at the verse. Verse 3. You, you circle the work. Your work. The work can be seen, am I right? Your work, good Christian lives, holiness, singing praises to God, you're singing loudly, whatever. Your works, but produced by what? The outside thing produced by faith. Faith is the inside thing. Only the born again person have the faith to produce the work. And then you see the labor. The labor, you know what is labor? Suffer for the gospel, you know. Uh, Prompted by love. Love is the inside thing. Your labor. You can see people labor in the church, labor for the gospel. And some people also, uh, endurance. They have the endurance. They can be seen, you know. They are suffering, you know, over a period of time. They endure, endure again because they know their hope is not on this earth. Am I right? So you can see these people going through trials, tribulation, the endurance. Outside you can see it, but... Prompted by what? Inspired by what? By the hope in a person. So the faith, love and hope come from a born again life. A truly regenerated life in Christ. So that thing enables you to work it out. To live out. 
So this is a complete holistic Christian life. You get what I mean? Complete holistic one. And I want you to know the changes on the inside will happen on the outside. So, um, so let's understand this holistically. You know? Let's not just talk about something on the inside only. Oh, you are love. You are love. You are blessed. You know? And don't just talk about or outside thing. Oh, look at you, your conduct, your behavior. Is there any good performance in you? It must be holistic, okay? So, so for a person who is born again, he will experience this in his life, okay? With the inner faith, love, and hope, he will start to take God seriously in his living. Uh, you won't be light. Okay, of course, sometimes, I would say sometimes, um, we are not perfect. Uh, we can fall into weakness. We can fall into sin. But it, we won't come, a born-again person won't come to a state where I don't care. I don't care how I live. I come to church just because of my parents, but I go home. I want to live my life my way. I don't care what God thinks. No, the born-again person cares about how God thinks. Understand? So, so over here, verse 4, okay, Paul came to the topic that we are going to touch on today. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Now, loved by God, He has chosen you. Underline it. So how do you know, okay? How do you know? On what basis? Um, Paul is sim simply saying, I know the transformational work of God had already happened upon you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is upon you. Why? Because, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Now, this is the first evidence. You know how we live among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, in spite of severe suffering. Look at the evidence. Uh, in spite of the severe suffering, you welcome the message of the gospel with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, the joy given by the Holy Spirit. There was an instance that you could not have any joy, no peace, but somehow, something inside you, even while you are suffering in trials, gives you the joy. What is it from the Holy Spirit? You get, you get what I'm trying to say? Okay, you get what I'm trying to say? Now, He is confirming with them. How do you know you are loved? How do you know you are chosen in Christ? Brothers, you who are loved, chosen in Christ. I'm telling you now. Okay, understand. Little boys and girls, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you're disobedient to your parents, you know, or you get stubborn, self-centered, selfish, everyone think bad about you, you know, the boys and girls. Think about it. During those times, are you still sure that the Lord loves you? Are you still sure that you are chosen in Christ? Now, I'm talking about this now. Okay, understand what I'm talking about. And Paul is trying to confirm with the Thessalonians church. And so, so what happened is, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. From what? How, how do you think their works become known? From their works. Now, now we talk about works. Yeah, from their works, from the way they live, from the way they talk. People know that they are true believers of Christ. And therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. And why are you giving us the reception? Because it's the gospel that you love. So they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There's a turn from idols, from the world, to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, let us be right first about our salvational doctrine. I was in Christ for almost 10 years, but I didn't get this very clear. And, and those of you, if you're still not very clear about this um, identity in Christ and how salvation came to a person and by what means, how it came upon a person, and, and what is this eternal life, whether you have it, now you get it clear today first, salvation. 
Yes, salvational doctrine I'm talking about. Mm. Uh, now, the Bible says very clearly, a few things, okay? A few things you get, must get it right. Salvation, salvation is by grace through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Now, I say it again, salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. What is by grace? Let me talk about by grace first, okay? What is by grace? Meaning, there is absolutely no, nothing in your condition, in your personality, in your humility, or any humanly traits that will give God a consideration to save you. You understand? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every man is evil. Every man is dead in sin and transgressions. No matter how many good works they have done, no one can perceive the will of God and glorify Him in their lives. So no one has any sets of condition to tell God that, hey, I have certain traits that you should save me or you should convict me, you should give me the faith to believe in Christ. No. It's absolutely from God. Okay, so it is out of His grace. What I mean is you've done nothing to deserve. It's all out of His grace. He has given you out of His grace. He, out of His grace, He has given you the faith to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You understand? It has nothing to do with the cultural context or the background context you have. It is not because oh, your parents are Christians or because you are in a mission school or you have the opportunity to hear about Jesus when you were young. Nothing to do with that. There is no way you could genuinely believe in Jesus unless by His divine intervention. You understand what I'm trying to say? It is all by His divine intervention, by His supremacy, choice that He made known to you the salvation. So there's nothing you do to deserve this. You understand? So don't put your faith before the grace. You understand? Oh, because I believe. Uh, yes, faith is given you to believe, but grace, grace enables you to believe. You understand? Grace enables you to be touched. Grace enables you to hear the gospel understood it and believe it accept jesus genuinely into your lives that that is why i say it's always the super this is the supernatural it's the supernatural work of god it's not natural supernatural work but it's kind of hard for some of us to comprehend it it's easy for me to comprehend this because i came from non-christian family with non-christian family the odds are against believing but for my kids it's hard for them to, to understand because usually they would think this as natural no, because they came from a Christian family so by default they become Christians no, no one becomes Christians by default it is a very work of the Holy Spirit I said again who enables you to believe so that you start right now you start right in your faith knowing that it is He who gave you the faith if it's He who gave you the faith am I right? He will take absolute responsibility to preserve your faith. Amen or not? Say amen to that. He will preserve your faith. I give birth to my children. I take responsibility to raise them up. Am I right? So this is the same. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of yourself. And second, Uncle Patrick is going to ask all the kids about these few things. I'm going to make this right for the kids. Okay. Second, salvation, okay, I just use S, is persevering. Is persevering to the end. What do I mean? Okay, there are two understandings to this truth, okay? What do I mean by persevering to the end? First, you will never ever lose your salvation and go to hell, okay? Because you did nothing to be saved, you cannot do anything to undo it. So even if the prodigal son left home, he is still a son. You will not change from a child of God to a child of devil. 
oh, just because of your weakness or your sin, or you say, oh, okay, I make a decision not to believe now. No, no you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You understand what I'm trying to say? Uh, or you have backslided, you know, so you change from a child of God to a child of devil again. And then you believe again from a child of devil to a child of God. No, this has no basis. You understand? You will never, if, if you have genuinely, by the Holy Spirit, accepted Christ, okay, receive Him, born again. Now, then I tell you that, I tell you that you will never go to hell again. So this is persevering to the end in this case. Second, okay, second it also means because it's persevering to the end, there is absolute intervention by God in your life. Absolute intervention by God in your life. Meaning there can be no instances that God forsake those He loves. So if you fall into sin, you stop going to church, uh, backslide, and you have come to a point of not having anything to do with Christianity anymore, now don't think at those moments that God is not going to leave you alone. He will not. He will intervene in your lives. You will be an unhappy person because of the Holy Spirit prompting and rebuke inside you. you know? So you'll be unhappy, you'll be miserable. You know? A lot of things will happen in your life, failures, and you don't know why. You just cannot be contented with the world. That is the intervention of God because His love is persevering to the end. Amen? Understand? Persevering to the end. So by that you know you are love. All right? And three, okay. And salvation, third, is the basis. I kept talking about it. Salvation is the basis for good works. Now we have to be very clear with regards to teachings on good works. <laughs> you are never saved by works. You are never saved by performance. All right? That's clear. That's very clear. You cannot go to God and say, Oh God, because I've done this and this as a Christian, so you save me because I'm obedient to my parents, or because uh, I go to church, so you've got to save me. Huh? Uh, no, you know, right? <laughs> you cannot say that to God. But, listen up, but when real, genuine faith has entered you, you will want to obey your parents. You will want to go to church. You will want to be selfless as what God has commanded. You understand what I'm trying to talk about? You, you understand? Uh, the transformed lives coming into you will give you a transformed living. Now, so don't get confused. Now, pe many people confuse themselves. Okay, so I believe. Why am I like that? Why am I still doing this? Why am I still very selfish? I believe. Okay? Now, examine yourself. Now, you cannot understand it that way. You cannot understand salvation that way. You are looking at good works and using good works as a basis for salvation. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about salvation this way. The Bible talks about salvation. Now, you, because having believed the holiness of God enter into you, that you have no choice but to be holy. And if you are tempted and you fall into sin, there will be a struggle in you. There will be a struggle there will be a guilt in you and you will want to resist it inside you because the holiness of God has entered you. You got what I mean? So you will want to obey your parents because God says so. Not because you have obeyed your parents, that's why you are safe. No, you got what I mean? So salvation must be the basis for doing good. Mm. I'll give you an example. My son, where's my son? <laughs> so, my son would want to live his life right at home, doing good to all the family members at home. Why? Why? Because he likes to do good? No, because of his relationship with me. Understand? With his father. Because of that, he wants to do good to all the family members, to want to clean the house, do everything right. He seeks to. He tries to. Although sometimes he couldn't. You know what I mean? But he tries to because of his relationship with me. So, he wanting to do good come from his relationship with me. You get what I mean? Salvation. Salvation is about this. You having developed that relationship with the Father God will give you 
the inclination to His holiness and the inclination to resist sin and temptation. So if you are never clear about your salvation, only thinking that you are all right Christian, you are saved because you have been doing the right thing so far, you haven't committed great sin and all, then you may be wrong. You are never grounded in your Christian life. And if you are backslided, all the time you were thinking is, I backslided. God might reject me when I go back to heaven. And you start reading verses that tell you, I will spit you out. No, no, those verses just refer to you. No, you will think about, I'm going to be spit out. I'm going to be thrown to the dark with just gnashing of teeth, you know, that kind of thing. You know, you will read verses like that because you are never sure before about what has been happened on you. What has happened on you supernaturally done, not by yourself, not by your choice, but by the Holy Spirit. You get what I mean? Okay? So this is doctrinal. This is doctrinal. I put it right first. Okay? But now, I know everyone wants to ask, so how do you know we are safe? How do, no, how do we know we have truly believed? That's the question. How do we know, how can we be assured that we are really loved and chosen? Oh. How do we know we have really believed? Now, this is the question, am I right? So, the second thing is, uh, I want to talk about is evidence of being loved and chosen. The evidence. Now, we need evidence. That's why Paul said, examine yourself to see that you have not failed the test. You're really safe, am I right? Are you? Did you examine yourself? What happened in you and outside you? Can you see that you are of God? Now, have you examined the evidence? That's what Paul is talking about. So I see a lot of zealous Christians having a hard time even answering this question, are we loved and chosen in Christ and never to be forsaken? They have a hard time answering this. Well, and I think, I think they have failed to examine that their faith is from God and, and over here, you will see in Paul's letter, in every start of the book, Paul will try always to make it clear to the believers. And right here, now, if you would turn with me to chapter 1 again, verse 4. Now, I'm going to read this again. Now, listen. For we know brothers love by God, love, and that He has chosen you, chosen, okay? Why? Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Now, now Paul said something very, very uh, crucial. Very, something very crucial, very vital that you have to hold on to. Okay, He said, our words, meaning the gospel, am I right, that he's bringing, came to you not simply with words, but also with power, what power? The power that comes from the Holy Spirit with, from Holy Spirit and with deep convictions. Now, another translation for deep conviction is full assurance. Now, what does this mean? Now, with regards to a born again Okay, with regards to born again, Paul is talking about the supernatural work of God that can only be done by the Holy Spirit. Now he says, the gospel don't just come to you simply with words. Simply with words meaning what? Simply as a doctrine only. Simply as a religion only. Now some people accept Christianity just like a religion. Or the word, it doesn't come to you like a emotional experience only like the sister that i just mentioned okay uh right he she cried her heart out you know no one and, and i was thinking why she cried uh, i see people crying you know when they sing hymns you know coming to church for the first time and you know, when they hear the pastor preach they're crying and crying then, to a point that then i realized some people cry because they need love but they might not need god you understand so when they hear, wow, there is a God foreign to me called Jesus. He loves me so much. Oh, since young, my parents didn't love me. Now my boyfriend didn't love me. Oh, my boyfriend didn't love me. So now this God loved me. So she cried. She cried. But not God. You get what I mean? 
The Holy Spirit will always lead us to God. Even the message of love come, the message of grace come, it will lead us to God, to Christ as the salvation giver. You get what I mean? So, if a person just drawn towards that peace, or drawn towards that love, or just that special experience in Christianity, but not drawn to God in spirit, he hasn't experienced the born-again transformation yet. You get what I mean? So after crying and sinner's prayer, doesn't see the need to follow God. Or for some people, it can be just religious and richer. Just do sinner prayer. Uh, can, can you imagine, you just do a one-minute confession. It's no trouble, just do it. Uh, take it as a path to heaven. So this is richer. So people thought, sinner's prayer, you are safe. No, sinner's prayer is not equivalent. Yeah, for some people, yeah, it's equal. For some people, because the transformation, the born again happened. The born again happened during the sinner's prayer. But for most people, I realize it doesn't. For most people. So, um, so that's why Paul said, the gospel came to you not as a religion, not as a doctrine, not as a ritual, no, whatever. People just accept, oh, good, Christianity, good. Uh, it, asks, it tells people to do good. Okay, I, I'm fine with it. Not that. It came to you with the power of the Holy Spirit giving you the full assurance as a child of God. So from then on, you guys, because you have understood the gospel, being made known to you by the Holy Spirit, you're living your lives with assurance as a child of God. You're not pretending or enacting like a Christian, but you're really thinking like a child of God. You're really living like a child of God. You're facing God, even with your weakness, you see, with full assurance, with deep convictions. Genuine faith has come to you. What Paul is talking about, the evidence, is right here. The gospel came to you, not with words, but with power from the Holy Spirit, with deep convictions. You get what I'm trying to say? <laughs> uh, so I, probably, is, it, is this very hard? for? Uh, can, you, can you nod your head if you understand? Or you, you just shake your head if you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying. I mean, those primary, primary four and uh, below cannot understand. I understand. <laughs> but... But all of you, you know what, what happened, what I mean by the supernatural thing happening to a person, you know? Um, how should I say? Now, when a person come alive in body and spirit, uh, now, it gives the same philosophy, okay? Say, when you say you are dead in your sins and transgressions, it's just like, let's say, in a bodily form. Lazarus dead in the tomb. So how are you going to tell the dead person, hey, you, make a choice to believe in Jesus. Come up! <laughs> no. Believe he's dead. Am I right? Not. So when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out! Now, when he make a choice to come out, that is called, but in spirit meaning belief, right? You make a choice to believe. But, before he responds to Jesus' words, what happened is God has resurrected him. This is called born again. You got what I mean? I'm using an analogy. You, know, you, you got what I mean? So the born again come first. It happened upon a person. Like last week, I shared to you about my cousin. I was arguing with him about Christianity. He, he just cannot accept that. Then one day, as he was hearing the message that blindness was taken away from him, and he felt love. That is the time the Holy Spirit, the supernatural work of God coming upon him. He experienced the born again. Then with that, he made a decision to believe in Christ. You got what I mean? That, that is uh, what I'm talking about. So when the gospel came to you, it's not just, oh, another religion, Christian, Christianity, there's a God who loves us. Okay, good. Just keep it in check, you know. Or if you want me to do sinner's prayer, I just do for you. No, not simply like that. But when it came to you, when you heard the gospel, what happened is the Holy Spirit worked so powerful upon you. It transformed your mind. That from then on, you begin to live and think like a child of God with full assurance as a child of God. You get what I mean? I'm talking about 
transformation stuff. It's the spiritual thing that you have to understand, okay? So when a person has went through this, he knows. Of course, this is very subjective. It happens inside the person. Only that person knows from that day onwards. He is not just a church goer anymore. Oh. And for our children, you know, I pray one day you realize you are not believing in what your father or your mother believing, but I'm believing in my God, my father. Deep convictions. Okay? And then, second, what is the evidence? And Paul went on to say, and Paul went on to say, verse 6, he became imitators of us, of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with joy. Now, it talks about severe sufferings over here. You know what happened? If you read Acts chapter 17, you will see that when, when Paul was at Thessalonica preaching the word, what happened is the unbelieving Jews, they were jealous because the Gentiles, the Greeks are believing or even some Jews, they are departing from Judaism to Christianity. So they, 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 they gather the bad characters, form a mob, start a riot, and they drag Jason and some of the brothers to the city officials. You read chapter 17 of Acts, okay? The book of Acts. What happened then was like that. So there was very severe suffering, very, very great trial, okay, severe suffering, coming upon the brothers in Thessalonica. And what happened is, hey, even with that, there was joy, strangely, amazingly. How can a person have joy? He should have fear, right? Or some people just puzzled, why must I suffer these things? And just give up. But these people not only didn't give, they have joy. Now, if I just preach the uh, gospel of Jesus to you, plain gospel for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son and all for you, and, and you're so loved, you know, you know, God has come for you, hallelujah. You can be joyful while hearing that. But that is still not the litmus test yet. The litmus test is when the suffering come, you not only didn't give up your faith, but you count yourself worthy of that suffering. You count yourself worthy of that suffering. Even when the suffering come, Lord, I know you're with me. You're pleased with me. And you know why I'm suffering. That's why Paul said, the joy from the Holy Spirit who has already indwelled in you. He has indwelled in you already. That's why with this severe sufferings coming, it's just a test to help you know that you have truly believed. Understand what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. Now, of course, I recognize there are different depths of faith for everyone. In a certain sense, what is possible for one believer may not be possible for another believer. Say, for instance, I can have the faith to give $1,000 to God. Some people only have the faith to give $100. Am I right? that kind of faith, or some people can, can have the faith to suffer to a great extent, like Paul, but some people with a little kind of tribulation, or people just, uh, the parents just scold them, hey, don't go to church, and they're so frightened, you know, no, very scared, very scared of trials, very scared of persecution, there are people like that also. Now, but I'm not talking about this kind of faith. I'm talking about right here, why these people even when they face with that sufferings there, that trial, tribulation, what enable them to have joy and peace and even willingness to suffer for God? That is the Holy Spirit. Now I'm talking about, just now I was asking the children, you know, are you happy about coming EYF? Some say yes, some say no, no, I don't know. <laughs> but for whatever reasons, you know. But, but let me just, talk a bit more relevant about suffering. Now, uh, God gave us different degree of sufferings. Sometimes it may not be suffering. It may be inconvenience or some trying moments. You know. Say, for instance, um, say I remember our, our sister Audrey, okay? And every week, uh, she, she studied till 5.30 p.m., you know, and she would rush home, do homework, you know, and then at 7.30, 7.45, she has to be downstairs and would fetch her to EYF. You know. And then she's doing this every week. You know, and the exams come, of course, the intense stress come. You know. 
but she's getting used to it. And sometimes, you know, when we have this kind of inconvenience and busyness, we're still coming to church, and then slowly we even find the joy of coming. Then you ask yourself, why are you reacting like that? Is that from you or the Holy Spirit? You get what I mean? So what Paul is trying to say is, look at what is happening inside you. Who gave you that joy? Who is living in you? Who have transformed you? And he who have transformed you and have lived in you will never leave you. You get what I mean? What Paul is effectively saying is that. I remember, uh, say for instance, some of you say, uh, um, say because of your commitment to church, you lose your chance to be promoted or promotion, opportunity, your boss won't consider you because you're always in church, not working overtime. Okay? Say for instance, Randy, I'm not saying <laughs> you will be short of promotion, but sometimes, you know, that kind of thing happens. But when you know that your boss doesn't consider you because you have been going to church so much so that you didn't do overtime, that he wanted you to do it so much, then somehow you don't feel the loss. You feel worthy to suffer that loss. You count yourself fit to suffer. For... And then you know why. Because the Holy Spirit is in you. I was in, busy with a lot of ministry when I was in my uni days, you remember? And then I remember there was a paper I was very confident of getting A. But I don't know why because of, you know, of all the busyness schedule and all. And, all. and then I, I remember the next because of the, the paper, uh, no, because of the ministry and the meetings I'm going to attend. So initially, I have a thinking that maybe God will bless me. I used to be Christian thinking, you know, if I give my, myself to God, that's what my pastor always teach me, you know, give yourself to God, God will give you the best, you know, and we always associate the best with, okay, if I do for God, God will give me what I desire, am I right? So I want an A, and I think I can get an A, but eventually I got a B or a C. I don't know why. Then I struggle for what isn't that what God promised? And God didn't promise that A. But when I got the B and C, and I think through and I confirm, actually, yeah, I would have got an A. If not for me being so busy with church and ministry. So that means I got a C because of the gospel. You get what I mean? Then when I start to sing like that, I felt, yeah. I count myself worthy, fit to suffer for the gospel in that sense. You get what I mean? And, and that I don't feel the loss. In fact, I feel the contentment, the satisfaction. And then one day I began to realize, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. That, that's the imprint of the Holy Spirit. You get what I mean? Like Eugene, oh, failed the first paper. <laughs> right? So it happens to him also. Without that, I wouldn't be so affirm about him. <laughs> so, you get what I mean? So there was sufferings of different degree but it is more to show you that your faith is genuine it's not for pastor to see it's for you yourself to find assurance in that okay and three and paul said over here uh, and that the Thessalonica believers they become a model to all believers in macedonia and Achaia. now Listen up, huh? their faith in God has become known everywhere. So Paul, what is he talking about? For your faith to be known everywhere, it has to be consistent good works. Am I right? Consistent good works and endurance in Christ. The key word is consistent. I'm looking for this. Now, salvation is not by good works, yeah? but let me say, if anyone who is born again, he's drawn to God's holiness, he will want to do good, he will want to endure for the gospel, but it's not a one-shot thing because some people can do it one-off. Emotional charge up, spiritual charge up. Why? Because you, after you attend a conference or you hear a positive testimony and you start giving your money, uh, start giving your energy, your time to the church, but only for a short while. After a short while gone, you lose the zeal. Then you know it's all emotions. You get I me? Mean? But if it's real, if the transformation is real, and it keeps coming, and, and you are suffering, but the Holy Spirit working powerfully through you, you realize your good works will be consistent. 
You will try to fight sin and resist temptation. The consistent I'm talking about. It's not a one-off thing. I've seen so many people charge up in church after conferences and all. But I'm not looking out for those things. I'm looking for people who are consistent. Consistency is the best evidence that you have been born again. Consistency. Okay. Uh, so, are you trying to say that Christians won't fall into sin? Uh, no, we are not saying that. You understand what I'm trying to say over here? I am. Would a born again Christian fall into sin? Yes. Okay? Let me say that. But he will not take pleasure in sin. He will, he will not be, be contented, satisfied like that. He will live unhappy life. Say, for instance, uh, if you're not on good terms with your parents or you're addicted to computer games, you, know, you can enjoy that moment for a while. But after that, the emptiness will come. And most of it is from the Holy Spirit. And it's from the Holy Spirit, I would say. It will be. So... So one last evidence that I realized that gives me great assurance that I'm loved and chosen is the discipline from God. Now, I get my assurance a lot from discipline. Now, no one likes to have discipline. And some Christians, sometimes we are very sick about discipline. Why God has to discipline me all the time? You know? Why He don't just give me what I want and make me happy? We keep thinking about that. But let me tell you, the Bible says, God loves those he loves. God disciplines those he loves. Am I right? God disciplines those he loves. So if you find yourself backsliding, you know, not taking the word of God seriously, being ad- addicted to the world, you know, certain things or wherever. And and it is by right. Let's say, don't study, don't obey parents. I went through all these things, you see. And I don't know, before my parents disciplined me. I feel the emptiness. I feel the restlessness. I'm unpeaceful. I'm not productive. I'm doing everything, but I'm not enjoying it. That's the discipline of God. And when I keep on going that way, somehow, someday, something will happen to me, some failures or some things that I don't desire or things that I... I, very, um, Some very unfortunate events, I would say. Unfortunate events really happen and it's the discipline of God. Now, even today, as a pastor, now I've gr- when you have grown to a, such, a certain maturity, uh, now, if a, if a child, he is not mature, when the father canes him, he make a fuss out of it. Am I right? He make a fuss out of it. But when you are mature, when your father scold you, you take a deep thought about why he scold you. Right? Am I right? Even as a pastor today, sometimes... Say when I didn't do certain things rightly, when I reacted too self-centeredly or judgmental towards people, no, there will there will be convictions, there will be prompting and and correction from the Holy Spirit, and that is the time where, where I quiet myself to pray. Sometimes I have to demolish certain of my uh, own values or mindset about things, you know. But I appreciate what God is doing upon me. And especially when He bothers to do that to me, I find the assurance in His love. I don't know whether you find that or not. But some people just kick up a fuss or get very temperamental. I know God disciplined me. I don't care. You know? And then get very numb about everything. Now, that is you are in childhood of Christianity. But when you have mature, somehow when something happened, let's say you fell sick or, you, or something not so ideal happen to your unfortunate events happen. Um, you quiet down to pray and reflect upon your lives. I would say not all the time because you have done wrong, but sometimes if God correct you in certain things, no, find a joy and, and thank God for it. Um, and because you are loved and chosen, that's why you are disciplined. So evidence of being loved and chosen. Lastly, I'm coming to the end of the message, okay? Um... Now, knowing you are loved and chosen is not a knowledge. It's not a knowledge, but a strength. 
Now, a string. Now, please confirm with everyone later on. What do you mean, Pastor, when you say, knowing you are loved and chosen in Christ? It's not a knowledge. I don't want it to remain a doctrine. Oh, yeah, I know, once saved, forever saved. This is absolute truth, you know. So am I saved? Okay, I'm saved, that's it. No, I don't want it to remain just a doctrine. I want it to be a strength. So knowing that you are loved absolutely in Christ will give you the strength to love. And the strength to love unconditionally and with humility. Okay? Unconditionally and with humility. Love. For he who is loved will love. Okay? Understand that? Now, I, I want to share some testimony about loving people. It used to be for me, I'm a, uh, there was a point of my Christian life. Huh? I was like a love Pharisee. Do you know what's a love Pharisee? Uh, I, I was like loving people so much <laughs> to a point that I get so critical about people not loving enough. And I, I get judgmental about why that brethren like that? Why that brethren without love? Why is he not sacrificing for his brethren? So I kind of become judgmental and start kind of condemn people for not loving as much as I'm loving people. You get what I mean? So I became a love Pharisee. Now, that's not the right kind of love. That's not the right spirit of love. Uh, you, you know, there are some believers in, around, you know, in, in Singapore, or in, in, usually in the developed nation, they always talk about grace, hyper grace, you know, you know hyper grace teaching? And the believers are always talking about everything is grace, and all by the grace of God, it's the favor of God, you know, everything is like that. And then these believers, you, you talk to them, instead of getting grace from them, you get condemnation from them. So they, they become grace Pharisees. So when they talk to you, and, and you, you, they will talk, tell you things, oh, you don't understand grace. Oh, you think like that, you're of the old covenant. Oh, you, you, you're not liberated as a Christian. <laughs> so that kind of thing. I have a cousin who, who, who's very much into this kind of teaching. When I talk to him, just a little bit about discipline, he says, come on now, God don't discipline us. God is not angry with us. In Christ, we're already liberated. He won't get angry with us. You know? So I feel so condemned by him. You know? So he has become like a grace Pharisee to me. I know it's paradoxical, but it's like that. I don't know, but I feel it's getting nowhere. And, and something went wrong with the fundamentals. Uh, grace and love are not supposed to be works. It's supposed to be a living spirit. You get what I'm trying to say? It's a living spirit where you live it out. When people couldn't perceive what you have perceived, you embrace them and you touch them with your spirit, and with your love and grace, not condemning people for not being like-minded. You know, some preachers, they are angry preachers. You know, it's angry, you know as angry preachers? Meaning they disagreed with everyone who disagreed with them. So, <laughs> in their preaching, they were like condemning everyone. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not an angry preacher. Sometimes I tell myself, I cannot be an angry preacher. I have to love genuinely by how Christ has loved me in, in Him. So, so, I want you to know, Knowing that you are loved and chosen in Christ doesn't make you a Pharisee. Okay, it makes you someone who loves genuinely, unconditionally, and with humility. Second, now, knowing that you are loved and chosen in Christ, it gives you the strength to pursue holiness. Holiness and good works in Christ, okay? Righteous acts of God. It gives you the strength to do so. Now, holiness is such a difficult word if you don't understand Philippians chapter 2, 13, that it is He who works in you to will and to act, ac to act according to His good purpose. You, you get what I mean? Philippians 2, 13, it is God who, so, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is He who works in you to will and to act 
according to his good purpose. So you see, a lot of people, when you talk about Christian, you talk about good works to them, they'll, they'll put the responsibility on themselves. Oh, I'm not, oh, I didn't make a good choice. I didn't make a good decision to resist temptation. I didn't make a good choice to live holy lives. I, it's me, it's me. So they didn't know that it, when he started that good work in you, when he by grace gave you that faith, now he is still present in you, convicting you sometimes of sin and convicting you to do good works, prompting you to love more than what you could. So you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why you fear and trembling? Why fear? You fear because you sense his holiness. You fear not because, oh, if I don't do good, I'm going to hell. No, it's no longer that. But you sense His holiness prompting you now. So when you acted selfishly towards others, towards your parents, you know, you fear the tremble. Lord, you are so concerned that you didn't let me go when, when I live like that, when I live in disobedience. You come to me with your holiness and righteousness and your rebuke sanctification you're so concerned about the way i'm going so you see you work out your salvation with fear and trembling that, that, that's, that's what it meant by philippians chapter 2 verse 13 okay uh, to pursue holiness and good work by that holy spirit in you because he who has done that good work in you will carry it to completion so holiness come like that mm. and and I would say, if people ask me a simple question, about, there was, there was a, a brother who, who came to ask me, what prompt you to pray, Pastor? I want to know what prompt you to pray. Now, I can almost immediately answer him two things. First is my love towards God. When you love someone, there is a need to draw near to him. Am I right? The second thing is, which is very true, what prompts me to pray, is when I start to sense in my spirit that I'm drawing away from God's holiness. Am I right? When I'm starting to draw away from the righteousness and the love of God, you know, I'm getting judgmental, I'm getting lukewarm, I don't know, but... Uh, you know, Martin Luther, I, I, I just uh, read about him, you know, when he was um, in, of prime age, you know, uh, he, he wrote something like, you know, every morning I wake up, I can feel that I'm backsliding. I need to pray. I need to get myself right before God. Now, even for such a great person like him, he could sense that I'm backsliding. I'm not taking the word of God as seriously as before. I'm not appreciating what he has done through me. I'm not convicted by what he has convicted me about. You know, that kind of thing. But of course, he didn't say it so clearly, but kind of holiness, what prompts you to pray? First, of course, by the love of God. That's why you need Him, right? Your love for God will, will draw you to pray. And second thing is, if you start sensing in your spirit that you're drawing away from His holiness, that is the time God is telling you to pray. Quiet down. Get yourself right before God. Reflect on your lives. Uh, the strength to pursue holiness. And, and lastly, knowing you are loved, and chosen in Christ will give you the strength to evangelize. To evangelize and testify. Evangelize and testify. Uh, I know this is a hard word, especially for those who hasn't experienced the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that strongly. But I think it's about having this deep conviction first. Okay, um, a lot of times we take evangelism as a works, as something we need to do, but not as a life. It's a life-giving thing. You know, sometimes when I encourage my children to, to evangelize or testify to their, their friends, and I say, hey, boys and girls, come, you know. Uh, today I heard, I, mean, I was talking to them, I say, hey, this is so-called friends, you know. He, he worshiped the dragon or what that kind <laughs> or or talking to them, and, and they were talking to them and they realized they don't know God or they're fearful about certain things. I said, come, go and evangelize. And they always tell me this, this simple reason, the common reason why they don't want to testify to their friends. And to put it in short, two reasons. First, they cannot present the gospel. 
They don't know how to present the gospel, meaning they don't know how to say it. They always tell me, I, I don't know how to say it. Uh, so you don't know how to present the gospel. The other thing is, they feel, <laughs> they feel that they will not believe. And, and scared, they will be laughed at. That they will appear too irrelevant to their friends. So this is the two common reasons. So, so I always tell them, I say, kids, uh, you, you will not find your reason to be a reason anymore when the Holy Spirit has come on you, but they don't understand. <laughs> so, so what the Holy Spirit? I don't see it, eh? I don't feel it. Eh? How? I'm still fearful. I'm scared. I don't know how to say, you know. So I don't know how to bring it across to them, but I tell them stories about how when I was having a really transformation experience with God, uh, it's not the dynamic faith that people are thinking about, you know. When I get my identity right before God, with full assurance, I'm a child of God, I'm living for the kingdom. That was then I realized I don't have to present the gospel. No, we want to present it so beautifully for what? It's not with beautiful words. It's just to share the gospel and tell people why you need Jesus and why only Jesus can help you. Simple. And you are not concerned with whether they believe or not or whether they find you relevant or irrelevant or not. Just tell them plainly. And then that is the time people will find you very relevant. You get what I'm talking about? That is the time. The Holy Spirit will work through what you are convicted with. So, so having the assurance of a born-again life and salvation is very crucial. Don't, don't let it remain just as a doctrine, but let it come upon you as a power, as a strength to love, to pursue holiness, and to evangelize for the Lord. Okay? All right, come, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us. I know that, uh, that your words will, will only work in us through the workings of your spirit. And I, I know, Lord, there are many people uh, here of different degree of faith, of understanding of your word. But I thank you for giving us uh, your, your Bible, your apostle who have written it so clearly, and he have confirmed it with the early churches, believers, that, that they are so uh, evidential. It is so evidential that they are people who have been converted by you. So, Father, I pray that this supernatural work of the Holy Spirit will come upon every, each and every one of us, that if we are still not sure or very unclear about what our lives is or where are we heading, Father, I pray that the Word may make it known to us. And I also pray that the Word will not just be a knowledge or doctrine, because we are not committed to doctrine, but committed to the Bible, to the life-giving Bible. And I pray that every time uh, uh, we hear your word, that we can take it seriously into us. Uh, let your word be thought-provoking in us. Let us think through what's wrong sometimes with us when we are not living the abundant and rich Christian life that we ought to be. Uh, because, Father, you know, uh, 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 unless the Holy Spirit works, nothing can be understood about your words. So I pray. Uh, that you work in the midst of us and especially our little children. They are taking the time to come here. Uh, but Father, so I pray that they will know you since young as the Joseph and David of this era.